Today, we're talking about Megamorphs 2 in the time of dinosaurs. Now, I've always been an admirer of the dinosaurs. Who isn't? Dinosaurs are awesome. So here we go, the Animorphs going back into the time of dinosaurs. How does this go about? Let's find out. Marco is at home and he sees on the television that there is a submarine, a nuclear submarine, one of those deterrents. And there's, they're in danger. There's a search and rescue thing going on. And Marco thinks, this is something we can help out with, which is awesome. I think, you know, they're not just sticking to the Yerk stuff or the Deal and Dan shit. This is actually really important. So the animals say, we need to go into this. And uh, I will say, straight off, off, off of this point, there is no Yerk involvement in this first part, nor is there any Yerk involvement, involvement in any of this. This is an entirely Yerk-free Animorphs book. Well, they're mentioned like a couple of times. Apart from that, they're just not there. And it's a welcome break. I mean, I know we, we, we read Animorphs for the fight against the Yerks, but this is, I think, one of the one times where the Yerks aren't the force that they're going up against. And it's a breath of fresh air. It's quite refreshing, really. Anyway, the Animorphs go to this beach. It's Pissing it down with rain, so they're not very happy, especially Jake, because he doesn't like the rain, apparently. And they go out to sea in Dolphin Morph, and it takes them quite a long time, which is very realistic, obviously, to find this submarine. It's way out in the ocean. They know that there are Navy divers nearby, and so they decide, we're going to help these divers. And as dolphins, they push a, uh, a diver towards the site where they found the submarine. And they start to send rescue vehicles, essentially little vessels, down to collect these divers and then leg it, swim it. And the animals are thinking that they're rushing off very fast here, very fast. And I forget how it's mentioned, but I forget how it comes about, but they realize there's going to be an explosion because this is a nuclear submarine. It's been submerged, it's damaged and... Pfft, I don't know how much damage that thing would cause. I imagine they're quite far out in the ocean. The water would probably absorb a, lot, absorb a lot of it. But that's going to cause a hell of a lot of damage. But whatever. What happens is something very strange. Because the animals are then whoosh back in time. 65 million years. And they, they look around. And they see these big things and axes like... There's something big approaching. Rachel's... Uh, st just shut up, Axe. It's just a whale. Keep your trap shut. And Axe is like... Put that, uh, uh. <laughs> and then suddenly... <coughs> Jesus Christ, I shouldn't have done that. These big... Dinosaurian sea monsters... Come along. And start to attack the animals. And they're much faster. And much larger. And so... Rachel and Tobias get chomped up. They end up in the mouth of one of these monsters and down the throat they slide. Doomed, dead, gone forever. You don't believe me? Fine. They're not dead. Should be, but they're not dead. <laughs> and then there's a, a great bit of leadership by Jake. Now I will say, Jake is impressive in this book. For from what I can remember, he um, he does a very good job, and there's no major flaws. He's going to get quite a high score in this book for his leadership. Page thirty-one. I've been on the surface when the monster had snatched them up and tossed them down its throat, but I couldn't think about that. I still had three people with me. I had to save them, and then he orders them to dive, orders them to swim away, and this is this is brilliant because. And I'm, I should expect the animals to have, um, what's the word, to work in a reasonable timeline without any contradictions, a continuous storyline, essentially. But it's great to see when it really comes into play. No, number 16, the warning, is where Jake learns to push aside that and just get straight to the decision. Do the leadly thing. Don't worry about <laughs> what's going on. Uh, that you can't control, just worry about the stuff that you can control. And that's what he did there. He's like, yeah, they, as far as we know, they're dead, but don't worry about that now. We've just got to sort ourselves out at this point. 
And well done, Jake. The, the Warning is such an important book, number 16, and it's, it's brilliant in the most subtle of ways. And we're seeing it come into action here where it wouldn't have done prior to 16, as far as I'm, I'm concerned. So the four remaining animals swim away. They, they, they do manage to get away and they end up on, on shore. And they look up and instead of seeing California and all its massive buildings and devastating homeless problems, they see a volcano and loads of trees. Loads of trees. And they think, what, what's going on here then? Where are all the homeless people? Where have they gone? And they start to quickly realise that something's not quite right. And Jake falls into a massive footprint, which is dinosaurian in its shape. And it slowly starts to dawn on them that things aren't right. They go to drink water. And as they're reaching into the water, they're in the middle of like a foresty, woodlandy area. They grab some water and then whack! This big, almost prehist well, not almost, definitely prehistoric crocodile, crocodilian, comes up and snaps at them and they jump back and like, what the fuck is going on here? And it's, uh, we get a great line from, from Axon here. I don't know, I admitted. Giant crocodiles, huge, aggressive whales or whatever, like nothing I've ever even heard of. And something big enough to leave a footprint you could turn into a paddling pool. I just don't know. Okay, fine, he said, obviously frustrated. Let's try it another way. Axe, you know more about physics and so on than any of us. More than any human, Axe said. You sure about that, Axe? Stars don't move. Yeah, I understand that that's from the TV show, but I just wanted to put that clip in there. <laughs> TV show Axe is ridiculous. The four survivors continue to look around and see what they can find. They need to find help in, in some way and they slowly start to realize, flipping heck, we're in dinosaur times because a Tyrannosaurus Rex, of which there are quite a lot in this story, they just seem to pop up everywhere, jumps out at them and starts to attack them and they manage to kill it. Well, Axe manages to kill it as it's distracted trying to eat Marco, who ends up in the T-Rex's mouth. Disaster. Utter disaster. Hmm. So they they cook this T-Rex, they the X chops it up and they eat it, and then they all turn to Cassie, who it turns out is Ray Mears. Or I would say Bear Grylls, but Bear Grylls is a bit shit. Steve Irwin, no, he didn't. But what's an American person that goes out into the woods and fucking puts fish on sticks and make shelters out of leaves. What's the American version of that? But whatever it is, Cassie is that now. Cassie is, I mean, it's understandable. It is understandable. She lives on a farm and she cares a lot for animals. So it's not too much of a stretch of imagination that she'd also be trained in bushcraft. It's a little bit of a stretch, but fair enough. She's there showing them how to make fire and build, were they building shelters? Well, they were making fire. And they were making sandals. Jesus Christ, Cassie, you could start a business here. You could earn some serious money. T-Rex sandals. 99 pence. 99 cents. It's American. So we can, we, we can, the middle of this book is, it's a bit strange. It's not, well, it's not so much strange as in a bit boring. Strange relative to the rest of the books. The rest of the book, I can't fucking speak today, can I? I need to try harder. Try harder, me. But there's a long stretch in the middle of this book that is just people walking around. It's like a season of The Walking Dead. You know, you've got the initial burst of activity at the start and you've got the climax at the end. And But in the middle, they're just sort of walking around, making fires and just sitting down. <laughs> That's the middle of this book. A bit of a letdown. At times, it does drag on a bit, but thankfully, that doesn't last too long. So the four surviving animals just keep trudging on, off, off on an adventure. At no point do they decide, decide to maybe go back and look for Tobias and Rachel. They've just assumed that they're dead at this point. They find a cliff and they look down and they see these buildings and a flying saucer. 
They think, that's funny. There's no humans around. They ask Axe, who says, I don't know of any alien races 65 bloody million years ago. Why do you think I'd know that? And they decide to fly in, in their bird of prey morphs, just to see what's going on, or at least to fly over this massive ravine, as it were. And they fly up, and then suddenly they're being attacked by pteranodons. Big, flappy dinosaurs. And they're, they're forced down into this ravine, this canyon. And then they land on the, the bubble thing. Oh, no, we're skipping ahead because now we need to bring in Rachel and Tobias. We need to backtrack and cover the Rachel and ha Tobias half of this part of the story. So... They are in the belly of the beast after they've just been eaten. The four other surviving animals under Jake's orders have gone off and saved themselves. And Rachel and Tobias are being swallowed by this large seafaring dinosaur. Jake and the gang, as soon as they get to shore, don't bother sending out a search party. They just wander off. <laughs> They're just like, oh, fuck them. <laughs> don't even bother staying around to search. Let's just walk away. That's probably the one thing about Jake's leadership in this book that I'm a bit like, eh, really? <laughs> He's not even going to try, but whatever. Rachel and Tobias are going down into this dinosaur and they demorph they're, as they're being dissolved by stomach acid, which is pretty gruesome. Tobias is being crushed as a little bird that he is. It's going to take less time for him to get damaged. And so t Rachel decides... I'm getting out of here, so I'm going to morph something dangerous. And morphs the grizzly bear. And using the grizzly bear morph, firstly crushes Tobias, but also slices and dices her way out of the sea creature. And by this time, it's conveniently beached itself, <laughs> so they're just able to walk out onto the beach. But Tobias is still is injured. Rachel picks them up and says, well, what the, what the ruddy heck are we going to do about this? Hold on, why don't you just morph and demorph? Because as we all know, the rules in Animorphs are that. You know, because it's DNA, you get rid of your injuries. But no. No. Doesn't work. Rachel, in case you haven't noticed, our lives stopped making sense the day we walked through the construction site and had a spaceship land in front of us. Maybe it's some effect from the time travel. If that's what happened to us, I'll be sure and ask Axe if we ever see him again. Or maybe the Elemis messed me up when he gave me back my powers. It would be a relief to think that that... Whatever. That's the sort of half-hearted explanation as to why Tobias remains injured. And... It's not like it's brought back later on and explained, it's just never explained. That the typical way morphing works no longer works in this one particular scenario. Why? <laughs> <laughs> That's the answer. <laughs> That's it. That's the answer we get. Oh, fuck, who oh, fucking knows? And then Tobias uh, Tobi and Rachel are on the beach. Rachel has demorphed back to human. And she says... Well, you need to morph something to, to go here, there, and everywhere. And Tobias is like, well, I haven't got any use. We're in dinosaur times. I haven't got any useful morphs for this area. Now, at this point, I'm taking two particular scenarios. They're inside this dinosaur, and they want to slice and dice their way out. They come onto a beach. There's loads of trees in front of them. Tobias wants something that can protect itself and do well in that sort of environment. And I thought... Hold on, you are the two that morphed Hawk Bajia. Rachel, when you're in the belly of the beast, instead of just a grizzly with these claws, morph a Hawk Bajia and just fucking woof and you're out. <laughs> and then Tobias. A Hawk Bajia would probably do pretty well with the dinosaurs. Be a bit small compared to them, but those blades are going to come in damn useful. It's not mentioned once. Tobias says, I've got no useful morphs to this area. I brought this up on the Animals Discord and they said, well, maybe it's because they didn't want to morph sentient races, but you're 65 million years in the past. You're in the middle of a really fucked up situation. I'm sure Ket Halpak would say yes, Tobias. I'm sure she'd be like, thumbs up from me, you're good to go. But no, it's not even brought up, mentioned. It's almost like the authors forgot. It tends to happen a lot, so let's just move on. Rachel and Tobias also then go on their own little adventure. Tobias is perched on Rachel's shoulder. 
And then the next time we see them, he's in her arms being carried. And the way it's written is rather weird, but that's a very minor point. And then they get chased, chased by Deinonychus, which is a, a small dinosaur, a bit like a velociraptor. And they're in a bit of a panic, like, what do we do? What do we do? And Tobias decides, right, Rachel, put me up in that tree, and then you go off and morph over there as we escape these Deinonychus. And I will jump, he didn't say what he's going to do, but he was going to jump down, land on one, and morph it. And there's this whole scene, there's this whole scene where Rachel is desperately trying to throw Tobias into a tree. Let's take a look, shall we? She reached down and lifted me up. Like someone heaving a basketball from her chest, she threw me upward. Too low, I missed the branch. I flapped my wings, an instinct, a painful searing... She grabbed me again. This time she put her whole body into it. Up the branch, I flapped my good wings, spun in the air, grabbed. Yes, I grabbed my second talon and held firm. So obviously this was a bit of an ordeal, getting uh, Tobias onto this branch. <laughs> Let's go a bit further down. My branch was just two metres above the ground. That can't be right. Well, it's only a paragraph later. They spent all this effort fucking... Just to buy it. Oh no, too low. Catch. Try again. Kamehameha fucking... And it just manages to grab hold. Two metres? It's like that. <laughs> Unless Rachel is like minted, like yeah, you just have to go like that. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Authors, what are you doing? Two meters. Um, uh, words cannot portray my. See what I mean? They can't. They can't portray it. <laughs> they escape the Deinonychus. But not without morphing them, no, no, acquiring the DNA and morphing the Deinonychus and, and rushing off. And that's, that's when they end up at the same place that the surviving animals were, at the edge of this cliff. And suddenly they're attacked by creatures called the Nesk. And they first find it in an alien shape, like a big alien with a, with a gun. And it's attacked a dinosaur or whatever. And it starts to attack the animals. And Rachel swipes with her tail and lops the top of this strange alien off. She's like, oh my God, that was weird. But then they like dissolve and it's, it turns out they're a bunch of ants. A bit like the Velik. I believe it was the Velik. No, Venax is the Yerk sucker outer. I think it was the Velik, which is made up of loads of little insects. So this idea has been used before in animals, but I'll let it off because it's you know, is what it is. <laughs> this is a fun book, it's not a logical book <laughs> by any stretch. But then they, they run away and they're being attacked, there's a spaceship chasing them, this weird sidelong pyramid-like thing. And they jump over a triceratops and they say, right, there's a wall of Nesk over there, we jump left over this cliff to our deaths. Uh, Rachel, what, what would Rachel do in this situation? Take on the aliens face on and potentially get out alive, or jump off a cliff. What does Rachel do? Let's jump off a cliff, woo! It doesn't seem quite what, Rachel would be just headlong into that wall of Nesk, let's be honest. So a bit of a weird character moment there, but again, it is minor. It just allows the plot to conveniently move forward. And they fall, and they're going to fall to their deaths. But that's when the two groups are now combined, they see each other like, Jake, Tobias, Hello! <laughs> How are you? It's been a while. Oh, very good, thank you, yes. Very exciting things happen to me. The Pteranodons are trying to catch the Animorphs and Tobias grabs onto one of the Pteranodons' wings, swings over and starts to ride it and uses that Pteranodon to hit Rachel into the side of the cliff where she just manages to grab and slow herself down so she survives and it's just a bit silly. It's a bit silly, isn't it? That's like... It's like Looney Tunes level of silly. <laughs> and that's probably the worst part of this book is just that scene where it's just like, uh, what? I mean, granted, this whole book is a bit silly on the surface, but you can work with it to a certain degree. And then you get to this bit, you know, like, what? Nah, nah, that's just nah, nah. 
Oh, there's a, a, a bit I forgot, and it becomes relevant as we continue on through the story. When Tobias and Rachel first encountered the Nesk, back before they went over the edge of the cliff, something rather strange happened. It was speaking English. Now on Star Trek, you see aliens speak English all the time, like that would be normal, but in real life, when you encounter an alien speaking English, it's just weird. You figure at the very least they'd speak, be speaking Russian or Japanese or something. I don't understand how that would make sense, Rachel. <laughs> Answer, the alien says. We're dinosaurs, I said, feeling fairly idiotic. You speak now without making sound, explain. Why don't you explain, I said. Who are you? What are you doing here? And how do you speak our language? We hear while you are talking, listening long time since night. So, from stalking Tobias and Rachel for one night, they are now near enough fluent in English. I, I wish it were that simple. And before you say, well, there's millions of these nests and they've all heard and they work really quickly to figure it all out, let's zoom ahead to page 162, shall we? The Animorphs are now talking to the Makora, which is the second alien race we meet. And if you go through page 162, yes, it does when, that's, when it's not in Morph, Rachel said. I get the idea that you and the, the Nesk don't get along. They are attempting to destroy us. They want this planet uh, for themselves, blah de blah de blah And it happens several other times in the book where you understand. So the Makora also understand English. Isn't it funny how 65 million years ago, two completely alien races both know how to speak English? One of them is given the excuse of, oh, they, they spied on Rachel and Tobias for a single night, so now they know how to speak English. No such excuse is given for the Makora, who just so happened to understand English without explanation. It just seems a bit iffy. <coughs> Bad writing, sorry. <laughs> I, love, I love the authors. And it is a kid's book, and I understand that, but at the same time, there's, there's got to be a level of believability to this sort of stuff, else it, I just can't be immersed in it, because it's just patently ridiculous. <laughs> but whatever. Oh, and apparently Broccoli isn't from Earth. Now this is it's a funny thing, it's, it's not supposed to be taken seriously. We know from DNA that Broccoli is from Earth, and it evolved recently, and it was partly man-made. But, I don't know, I thought it was a nice little thing, just, just a very trivial, irrelevant thing that it was broccoli that they were growing, and I thought that was a, I thought that was a charming little touch in there, I will say. So what is it with these Nesk and Makora? They're two battling groups, and Makora came down recently because the, the rest of them were pretty much wiped out, and they settled down in this canyon on, on Earth, they've just started this little civilization, but it's restricted to this area. The Nesk go around destroying other races. We, as, as far as we know, they're not still around. They might be. Who knows? But 65 million years. Oh, for fuck's sake, why do I keep forgetting? Nothing really lives 65 million years. Not a single race anyway, so they're probably gone by now. But who knows? Maybe they're really, really advanced by this point. Who knows? <laughs> but, yeah, they're, they're, the Nesk want to eliminate the Makora, who are, for all intents and purposes, Quite peaceful and agreeable. Weird looking things like crabs with asymmetrical bodies and what have you, but the animals quickly start to get along with them and they become good friends and good chums. And they immediately start to take sides. But Cassie objects. And you know what? It's, it's an understandable objection. She's saying we shouldn't be getting involved in the fight between these two. We've got no stakes in this. That's a fair point. You, you don't know. On the surface of it, the Makora seem like the good guys and the Nest seem like the bad guys, but you can't just immediately jump to that conclusion and join sides with somebody. But there was also a good point made by the other members of the group. I think it was either Mark or Tobias. And they said, well, well, this is about our survival as well, essentially. So we need to protect ourselves, which may mean protecting the Nesk, and there's a whole thing about 
well, is doing something here going to affect the future? Well, in reply to that, does doing nothing affect the future? And there's this big philosophical conundrum that they've got to go through. And it's rather entertaining seeing the characters battle out amongst themselves. But they eventually decide to go out to a, grab a nuke from the, the Nesk base because apparently they know for certain that there's going to be one there, and Axe can pinpoint it, even though he's 65 million ye years late to this particular brand of technology. Axe, Axe will know, because he's an Andalai, and he solves those problems. Cassie really doesn't want to do it. She still doesn't want a part in this, really. But she goes ahead anyway, and they, they get taken out by the Makora, near to the base, and they morph Tyrannosaurus Rex. At least four of them do. Rachel and Tobias only have the Denonicus morphs and they're quite accustomed to them. So the other four morph Tyrannosaurus Rex for the first time and it's a bit manic. They can't control their morph. Rachel and Tobias are getting chased at first and are trying to warn the four Tyrannosaurs. You, you know, get control of your morphs. It's going a bit mad. These Tyrannosaurs find a group of, I believe it was Triceratops, and start to attack them. Cassie's the first to step back and say, whoa, 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 this is, this is going a bit crazy now. But the Anmorphs... Oh, no, no, it was Marco. Sorry, I, I actually got confused about this when I was reading the book. I thought it was Cassie. But it was Marco that's the first to step back and say, whoa, this is going crazy. And they end up killing... Well, Cassie ends up killing a Triceratops and starts to eat it. She's the last one to fully gain control. And she, she has immediate regret for this. And she goes on this long spiel of, I don't want to be a killer. We, we, we can progress beyond being killers. And it's quite a dramatic little moment. And it's also a very, a very important one, considering what our next book is going to be. And I believe this is a foreshadowing to what's going to happen in book 19. Very deliberately so. I just want to backtrack a bit to when they were first morphing these dinosaurs. There's a, another great line from Cassie being her good old-fashioned self. There are some things about Rachel I still don't understand, and things about me that must mystify her, I guess. Rachel loves the big predator morphs. I don't. I never want to hurt anyone or anything. Not even when I have to. Not even when there's no choice. <laughs> Book 16. <laughs> Book 16. Cassie, do you know I never want to hurt anyone or anything. Not even when I have to. <laughs> Joe Bob Finestra. Burn him. <laughs> yeah, do, do, does that skip your mind, Cassie? Do, that that little bit. So, you've done it before, where you have wanted to hurt people. You did it in book sixteen. You said that man must die. But in fairness, that was a very in the moment thing, and that was sort of semi addressed in book seventeen, where Cassie's questioning her own morality. So she really is the most intriguing character at this point because she's bouncing back between this Cassie in this book and the Cassie that we saw in book sixteen, which will suddenly turn up and say, "We you know, destroy this creature." And then page one hundred ninety four to ninety five, we get the result of this attack on the Triceratops. There are humans here, Cassie said. Us, we are human civilization. We have all that stuff inside us. It doesn't matter what year it is. That's all about um, human morality and religion. Okay, you're right, Marco snapped. It doesn't matter. If this were 1998 or 2000 or 2121, it would still come down to surviving. And what it's down to, and when it's down to kill or be killed, all that morality and guilt and all is crap. And that's a very Marco thing to say. Cassie stopped morphing. For a while, no one said anything. Then at last, Cassie said, You know something, Marco? You're my friend. I'd do almost anything for you, but you're wrong. Yeah, we're just animals ourselves, but we're the animals who can think. We're the animals who can imagine something better than kill or be killed. I don't think predators are immoral. I'm not an idiot, whatever you, might th whatever you may think, but I'm a human, okay? And I have to think and care and I have to feel things, otherwise I might well be some gangster or a Nazi. And there's a couple of little bits in here. But for one thing, I don't think predators are immoral. So why did you insist that Joe Bob Fenestra be executed back in book 16? Because technically that's a predatory action. Cannibalistic, cannibalism is still predatory. So you think he wasn't being immoral, so why would you demand that he be killed? Cassie... 
bouncing between all these standards that she simultaneously holds. We're the animals who can imagine something better than kill or be killed. Well, sometimes you don't have a choice, which is what Marco's saying, which is why you're fighting this war. Because Marco says, when it comes down, when it's down to kill or be killed, all that morality and guilt and all is crap. And that's happened. You, you kill Yerks and their hosts. Why? Because you have to. You put in a situation where you have to defend yourself and you have to take the life of somebody else. And those hosts are innocent, so the animals are taking innocent lives in order to protect their own. That's the whole thing Animals is doing. So Cassie is basically saying, I don't like this Animals thing anymore. I think we can imagine something better than kill or be killed, but that's what you do. That's what you're doing. And I think this, again, all leads into book 19, because we'll see as we come into book 19, this sort of attitude that Cassie's got comes, to, comes into play, essentially. And it's very intriguing, and I'm rather liking this Cassie saga, where she just does not know anymore. She really is just... It's all coming to a head now. Not a literal head. <laughs> but she's conflicted, and severely conflicted, because she started off this thing so set in her ways but that way those ways are now being challenged to the 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 biggest degree and it's really those ideas are butting heads within her and that's why we're getting these emotional swings from her and it's very intriguing and I've, i'm enjoying it and that i think is going to come to some form of climax in book 19 looking forward to it so then they travel to the nest base in their dinosaur morphs and apparently thought speech sets off the alarms but at first the nesk like well we don't see any mercura anywhere there's just these dinosaurs what the what, what is it is and they uh, gives them almost a bit of time to attack the the uh, base but i want to point out page 98 no 198 jake's leadership is awesome i like it Okay, Prince Jake said, here's what we do. Axe and Rachel head straight for the center warehouse. Axe to point out the nuke, Rachel to grab it. Because the Denonicus hands work better than the big Rexes. Marco and Tobias flank to the left, me and Cassie to the right. We rip open that storeroom, get what we come for, and head for the trees over there. Jake, I love it. I love it. Simple, straight to the point. Everybody knows their role. You crack on with it. And you know where you're going to go. It's a shame you didn't have any sort of backup plans in case things went wrong, but... That's, Jake is really coming on strong here. Him and Cassie at the moment are probably my favourite in terms of character development. At first it was Marco, but he sort of slowed down a bit. Jake and Cassie are now right up there. Rachel doesn't have any development. Um, Tobias and Axe are sort of middling up and down here and there. But yeah, Jake, love it, mate. So conveniently enough, the first building they decide to attack just because they feel like it that that's the one. Axe reaches in, and what do you know? A nuke! <laughs> great, great plot convenience, guys. It, it, the first building you come across, you don't recognise fuck all, because let's face it, it's technology 65 million years somewhere else. And Axe just picks this thing up and says, right, yeah, that's what we're looking for. I've seen one of them before. <laughs> I know exactly what this thing is. Yeah, um, yeah, that's plot. Con that's that's straight up plot convenience. So not not a great fan of that point. But they they run off, and the spaceships start chasing after them, and they start getting shot down before they can reach the edge of, edge of the trees. And I think Jake, it's Jake that's blown in half essentially, and the ship comes round and is about to fire again and does fire again. But suddenly the Makora come along. And a force field goes around Jake just in time. Now, if you've watched these videos, you know how much I hate the just in time trope. It's so Hollywood shite. I hate it. They came just at the nick of time. It doesn't happen in reality. Maybe once in a blue moon, but in the Animal series, it's like every other book we have a, woof, that was just at the right time moment. And I just get fed up with it. But yeah, the Makora are here now. One of their ships gets blown down as well as one of the Nesk ships. And the Nesk look at the animals demorphing and they must just step back and think, 
Uh, we've not seen that before. What are the consequences going to be if we attack them now? Because we don't know who they're with. Um, let's just... Let's fuck off. Let's just fuck off this planet. Fuck it. <laughs> we don't want to deal with this shit anymore. So they, they disappear. And the Makora take the animals up into their little ship. And that one of the things they do is they... It's a nice little moment, this. They take off one of the legs and put it on like a, a ceremonial thing. And the animals say, well, what's all that about? And they say, we can regenerate our legs. We take off our legs, sacrifice of pain, essentially, in memory of those who we lost. And the animals say, oh, we can't regenerate our limbs. And the chorus says, well, then you hold the pain inside forever. And it was like, ooh, that's quite deep. <laughs> But yeah, the Makora are cool. I like the Makora. Weird looking things, according to how the books describe them. But yeah, they're, they're pretty nifty and the animals like them too. So the animals finally like an alien race and what do you know? They doom them to extinction. <laughs> great, great stuff, lads and lasses. Great. <laughs> but there's been one member of the animals who, has gone, who knew that this was going to happen all along. Tobias. Because on page 171... This decision may not be clear, Tobias said quietly, but another decision may be so obvious we can't ignore it. No one asked what he meant because at that moment some Makora showed up with more food. Go forward to page 214. Don't make promises you can't keep, Rachel, Tobias said in thought speak whisper only I could hear. It will only make it worse later. I looked at him for an explanation, but the eyes of a hawk give nothing away. Just fucking say it, Tobias! Fucking hell, mate! You're such a dick sometimes! If you know what's going on and what's going to happen, why are you just holding on to it? Tell your fucking team. Jake will want to know that shit. But no, Tobias is like, nope, I swear myself to secrecy. Why? Because when it comes down to it, I want to make the this. I want to be able to make the decision so nobody else feels guilt. But what if you're wrong? What if you're wrong? Who cares if they're going to feel guilt or not? That's the whole thing about the whole... It's like the kill or be killed thing. You know, you, you, you make the sacrifices in order to survive. Sometimes, just telling the truth and putting guilt on someone will help you survive, Tobias. You, you've got to tell your team that. Because else you could be fucking them over. I don't like this Tobias character. He's just weird. He's weird and he's, he, he's not a very good team player, i found. He spills everyone's secrets. <laughs> don't, ever, don't ever tell a secret to Tobias because the whole fucking world will know the next day. And then this where it's just like... <sighs> okay, Tobias, so someone tells you a secret and you just blabber it fucking to everyone. You've got a secret, zip. Not going to tell anyone. Nope. Nobody. Fuck me. And all because he doesn't want the others feeling guilty for making the decision. Well, sorry, Tobias, but you're going to have to make decisions and you have to live with your decisions. That's not an excuse. It's just you being a twat. <laughs> Tobias, you're letting the team down, mate. And what it was, the big decision. So all throughout this book, we see this comet coming down. Axe at the start says that's on the tra trajectory to miss. But what the Nesk did when they left, because they said, fuck this shit, I'm out. They went up and they, because they're petty fucks apparently, diverted this comment so it would hit the earth and blow it all up. I mean, why? They're not even the Yerks would do that. The Nesk are even bigger dicks than the Yerks at this point. But they divert this comment. And the animals have now got this nuke, which they were originally going to use to close up the Sario Rip, which started this whole mess in the first place, so they can get back to their own time. But they, the Makora want to use it to blow up this comet before it hits the Earth. And, Tobi and they have a vote. Tobias tells... Well, Tobias didn't hold the secret to himself. He told Axe as well, but Axe is the sort of... <laughs> he's the sort of alien who'd just be like... Yeah, fuck them. <laughs> Not us, fuck them. And uh, they give this, this nuke over to the Makora. But Axe makes it a dud. 
somehow, even though it's technology he must have no knowledge of, maybe on like a basic molecular level, but the actual workings of the mechanism, I don't know how he figures it out, but whatever, he's an andalite, he knows everything. Makora take it, but it's a dud, and the animals, leg it! <laughs> they just go as far away as possible, and it takes a couple of days from the way the book is written, but they end up at the ocean where they first started. And what do you know, as the comet hits the earth and destroys the Makora, it closes up the Sario Rip, which started this mess in the first place, Brings them through time somehow that, so they see everything almost like the Elemist. Maybe it was the Elemist. Maybe that's a theory for later at the end of this because it happened in the end like Chronicles where the Elemist takes Elfangor and shows him all this weird stuff happening. And the Animorphs, as this comet hits, they sort of swoop up. That's how it's written. It's all like they, they swoop up and they see over the land and they see time progress and how everything changes. And it's, it always feels like the Elemist has had a hand in this somewhere. But that's a theory for another day. And they end up back at the site of the nuclear submarine just after the explosion went off. One wonders, would that not have an effect? Is there, what, is there no damage going to be done to them? But no, they go home. And that's the end of that chapter. And just to clarify at the end of the book, Jake says he tried morphing the Tyrannosaurus and it didn't work, which means that they don't have those morphs, they can't use them again. And then my favourite part of this book, page 238, a note. Hi, it's me, Tobias. After we got back from our adventure in Lake Cretaceous, I looked up some of the dinosaurs we encountered. All of them were around during the Cretaceous age. But paleontologists seem to think that some of them, like Spinosaurus, were extinct by the Middle Cretaceous, whereas we are in the Late Cretaceous. All I can say is that I was almost eaten by a supposedly extinct Spinosaurus, so who are you going to believe, me or a bunch of scientists with some old fossils? That's basically the authors coming back just before it's published and saying, uh, yeah, we actually looked this up, our timing is completely off for <laughs> these species of dinosaurs. Uh, uh, just put a Tobias note at the end. <laughs> They, we fucked up, is basically what they're saying. But it's, it's whatever. It's whatever, because it's dinosaurs. And they got other stuff wrong as well. For example, thing, Danonychus, for example, and T-Rex were, were covered in feathers. That, that's right, they were covered in feathers. But that was, this was a recently new discovery. I'm not sure if it was around the time that this book was released, but I can't expect Michael and Catherine to, to know the science of 20 years into the future when they're writing their books. But you know, I'm reading some of this stuff. I'm thinking, that's wrong, that's wrong. But it's a, I don't care. Not in, not in this particular case, I don't care, because this was fun. It's Megamorphs, like the first one. It's not really canon it's for a bit of fun. It's just the authors letting loose and doing with the animals what they feel like at the time. That is how this book feels. And I think they do it so much better in this book than they do in the first Megamorphs. I think this really is exciting, apart from the long stretch in the middle where they're just sort of wandering around doing nothing. There are flaws, of course, and I've pointed them out here, like the aliens both somehow knowing how to speak English. The whole Saria Rip thing where it's set off by a submarine exploding and then a comet hitting Earth closes it back up again. Whereas the Sarimorph in Book 11 was because of two ships firing simultaneously in space. There doesn't seem to be a really log logical consistency rather than large explosions. And why is it always that the Animorphs are the ones transported by the Sario Rip. I don't know. It's, the Sario Rip is a device they use to get the animals into a new place in a new time. Essentially. That's what a Sario Rip is. There's no concrete science behind it. Maybe someday in the future we'll try to theorise about it once I've finished reading the whole series and we've got a bit more of an idea of what's going on. But this book is just fun. It's fun. It's a, it's a nice read, it's nice to have a break from the Yerks, it's nice to put the animals into a new scenario and see how they would react. Yes, it's flawed. Yes, there are problems. Yes, it doesn't have a, a little bit... It doesn't matter at all to the main story, but th this is Megamorphs, and I believe, after reading the first two books, this is what Megamorphs is about. It's just the authors having fun, putting their characters into new situations where it's not going to have any consequences on the main series. And I think they did it a lot better this time round.
and I really like this book. I'm going to give it an 8 out of 10. I mean, it's nothing spectacular, so it's not a 9 or a 10, but nor is it average, really. It's good. It's, it's good. It's a good book, and a good book, which I give a strong thumbs up, is usually an 8 out of 10, so an 8 out of 10 for this one. Jake's Leadership is, is also around that area because he didn't really do anything wrong the part where he didn't bother searching for Rachel and Tobias is a pretty minor point, but apart from that, he was solid. Apart from he didn't plan anything, really. So, for the third book in a row, Jake's leadership score is going to be the same as the book score. So, Jake gets an 8 out of 10 on his leadership for this one. Pretty solid all round. Just needs improvements here or there. Yeah. Cool. Point of note, you've seen here that I've got two different covers. And I'm not, I think they're both from the UK. No, I think this is the American one because it's got American pricings there, whereas this one's got the UK pricings. Apparently the Canadian dollar is the same as the UK pound, but which do you prefer? Well, this one looks pretty much exactly like the Andalite's gift front cover. So I'm, I have a much bigger preference for this one, which is a snazzy little cover. It really is quite a nice little cover. It would have been nice if they had a bit more effects on, on these images here, but I'm quite a fan of that, and I prefer that one. So, what's the next book going to be? We've discussed it a little bit. It's going to be the climax, I believe, of Cassie's emotional conflict, and it's going to come in the form of Book 19, The Departure. I'm looking forward to this one because it's a, it's a big moment for our Cassie friend. If you like fan fiction, I've just finished book 64, and the links to my fan fiction are in the description below. This is book 55, The Interrogation. I've been working hard on these fan fictions for a few years now, so if you're interested in that, please go read it. Thank you very much for watching. It's been a long one, but it's a long book. <laughs> hope you enjoyed it too, and I hope you enjoyed this video. See you all later.